Okay, I think we'll get started um, and uh, folks will continue to arrive as they arrive. Um, but thanks for the folks who are introducing themselves. Hi, Betty. Hi, John and Carrie and Justine and Dave. So welcome folks, good to see everybody. And uh, my name is Shanti Gonzalez. I'm the Senior Manager of Canada Recruitment and Training for LCV National. Today, we're here to talk about why environmental leaders should serve on local boards and commissions. Um, and we are going to um, spend most of our time with some of our staff from our uh, Conservation Voters uh, for Idaho Education Fund team. Um, but just briefly wanted to talk a little bit about what is the League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. So we uh, are an organization that has many sister organizations, but this is our C3 organization and we work to turn environmental values into national, state and local priorities in collaboration with our state, with our LCVEF partners, who you're gonna hear about today. We advocate for strong environmental protection. We organize communities to speak up about their environmental values and we engage people in the democratic process in order to enact strong environmental laws. And um, we're gonna just briefly, what it, why would people serve on a border commission? And why is this a program that LCB National is promoting? So we started, um, we started granting funds two years ago to our state affiliates, because we believe that this is an important intervention in order to improve environmental policies in local communities. We wanna build the power and influence of environmental leaders we want to make local boards and commissions more reflective of the communities they represent. We want to develop strong leaders for public leadership roles. And the theory of change here is that we recruit environmental champions from among our members and the organizations that our state affiliates work with closely, especially folks of color, LGBTQ plus and underrepresented folks. We build their skills, their knowledge and their power as leaders. Uh, we support them as commissioners. We help them move strong environmental policies around, well, democracy, policies around democracy and the environment, because those are our two sort of um, key issues um, for LCV National and LCVEF. And then we want to keep our leaders engaged as alumni. Um, and so you're going to get to hear how the LCVEF, I'm sorry, the, how the Conservation Voters for Idaho Ed Fund program works. Uh, we want to keep our um, alumni engaged. Um, and then we want to share opportunities with them as they develop and grow as leaders to serve in higher public leadership roles. Um, so that could be moving from a city border commission to a state border commission or some other kind of important role in the community. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Relin. Um, I mean, sorry, to Tony, who's gonna tell us a little bit about their program and their lessons from their first year. And unfortunately, Relin Flores, who was gonna be with us today is dealing with a family emergency. So we have some additional, um, so we have Siobhan, who will introduce herself shortly, step up to kind of support Tony and um, talking about their program. So I'll turn it over to you, Tony, and you just tell me when to advance the slides. Okay, super. Thanks, Shanti, and thank you all for making time out of your busy day to be here with us today. Um, I really do want it to be a, a give and take. So if at any point you have a question, just go ahead and drop it in the chat. I am monitoring the chat so that we can address it in the moment. And then we'll hopefully have a few minutes of um, question and answer at the at the end and also at the end is all of our contact information so my name is tony belknap brinegar and i work for conservation voters for idaho and i will pass it to siobhan to introduce yourself hello everyone i'm siobhan von tobel the external relations director here at conservation voters for idaho thank you and then salome Hi, my name is Salome Mwangi uh, here in Boise, Idaho, and I am, uh, gosh, I cannot believe this, a past fellow <laughs> of the first cohort, and that was really exciting. Yeah, yes, yes, it's amazing that it's already. So um, I'm going to pass the uh, mic to Siobhan to walk us through how this program came to be before I started here at CVI. All right. uh, you can advance the slide, Shanti. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm pre-warning. I'm a few weeks from my due date, so pregnancy brain is very strong. <laughs> so it might take a while to formulate some thoughts, but 
Uh, just wanted to give a brief introduction of who we are. So Conservation Voters for Idaho Education Fund is our 501c3 arm of Conservation Voters for Idaho. So we're a statewide nonprofit organization committed to protecting Idaho's environment and quality of life by informing, engaging, and empowering citizens who care about our natural heritage and healthy communities. And we know that our strength lies in these communities. So in activating and mobilizing all Idahoans to take action and speak on behalf of their communities and fellow Idahoans um, in order to advance key environmental policies like protecting air, water, and access to open and green spaces. So with that, we know that our differences make us stronger. When we have more Idahoans at the table representing a wide range of beliefs, cultures, and backgrounds, we can make sure that no communities get left behind. And we acknowledge that environmental issues and threats to our democracy have had a disproportionate effect on people of color and other underrepresented communities in Idaho. So it's our responsibility and our priority to bring everyone with us in our work. And so that's why you know, this new fellowship program was so important to us. We know that by fostering greater civic involvement, such as building more representation on our governing boards, we're helping to secure the long-term health of both our democracy and our environment. And you can advance to the next slide. <laughs> so I think a big question is, you know, why Idaho? <laughs> Why out of all the states in the country, um, a state that is sometimes uh, mistaken for Ohio and Iowa, we get that a lot, <laughs> why Idaho? Uh, but for us, it was really, a, this program was a no brainer. For some time now, we've been particularly worried about the lack of representation on Idaho's regulatory and decision-making bodies like our state and local boards and commissions. In fact, a Boise State study back in 2016 found that only 30% of boards and commissions appointees were women. And that was back in 2016. And unfortunately things haven't changed <laughs> much um, before this fellowship program has started. <laughs> I, we're glad to say that it's starting to change now. Um, so it became very, very clear that not only the underrepresentation of women on our governing bodies was persisting over time, but that other communities in Idaho were also being underrepresented on these same boards. We saw even lower percentage numbers, sometimes you know, at zero, of appointees who identified as Black, Indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQIA+. For example, right now in all of Idaho, we only have one Black school board member, one Black state legislator, and zero Latinx state legislators. And I would like to add that our Latinx community is one of the fastest growing populations here in Idaho. Um, so that, that zero number is particularly astounding. So we knew that unless a significant number of people from these communities were appointed to more decision-making positions over the next few years, this imbalance would remain. So we knew that increasing representation on these boards and commissions, you know, it just made sense. Study after study has proven that whether in a governing body, in a nonprofit organization, or even in a corporate boardroom, more diversity increases the quality of work done. Um, and I don't know if Tony has anything to add. <laughs> no, um, Siobhan, you've done a really good job with explaining it. Um, the only thing that I will say is that Idaho is the fourth largest state in geography, but we only have one point eight now I think million people. So we have a lot of land and very few people. Um, a lot of Idaho is public land. Um, so we have lots of green space. And like Siobhan said, our largest population um, of people of color are Latinx folks, but we also have, I think six recognized tribes in Idaho as well. Is that correct? Is it six? So we do have um, in, in, uh, quite a few ind indigenous folks as well in Idaho. So I think we can advance to the next slide. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing too, when we were thinking about this program is really what, and really any um, CVM affiliate out there needs to think about 
it, are the conditions, um, what conditions are needed to establish a program such as this? And really think about who you want to train in, um, in your program. So of course we really started with what are our current relationships with these um, communities that we identified as being underrepresented in our state and local boards and commissions. And that was really key. And I think that was a key part. Tony will have um, more insight into this, um, but whether or not we had uh, current relationships um, with who and what relationships were really needed. And so I know Tony did a lot of work um, just in the beginning, just reaching out and building new relationships. And as we know, relationships take time. Um, they're, if they're built on authenticity and trust and respect, they take time. Um, so that was something that we knew we wanted. We wanted to take the time and um, we wanted to be authentic about it. And we really also had to identify our other state partnerships with um, local and state nonprofits, um, with community leaders and you know, with the governing boards themselves. And I think the biggest thing is really identifying the, the desire for it from these communities that uh, we identified that the program was going to uh, benefit. Did, did those communities really want um, this type of program? What, if they did, what type of um, skills and tools and education did they really um, see would benefit from such a program? Um, and you know, if you don't have the desire there, why have the program <laughs> anyways? Um, you guys and, want to tell us, uh, Siobhan or Tony, who's in the photo here? Oh, Tony, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, so who's in the photo is um, Julie Yamamoto. She's from District 10, so she's a state legislator. And Nick Wyatt was one of the graduating fellows. Um, and so the other, the other population, the other couple populations that we look at in Idaho is um, people who are in rural areas, people who have disabilities of any sort and people who are who have lived in poverty or currently living in poverty. So um, the focus is really what Siobhan's talking about, BIPOC folks, LGBTQIA and, um, and women. Because again, in Idaho, we, we have very underrepresented women in elected and appointed um, offices. And in fact, when I was traveling around in July, I went to um, Eastern Idaho. So I live in Western Idaho and that's where the program was based. So I'm trying to recruit in other areas. So I pulled some data from the different cities that I visited. And there was one city in particular where there was a, I think a 12 mem member board. It was the golf commission at Ida in Idaho Falls and there was zero women. So when I was there, I said, do you not have any women in Idaho Falls that golf or care about golf? And they were like, of course we do. So um, just pulling that data and showing people and exposing here are all these appointments that you could have and you're not, uh, and people aren't being invited other people outside of very small circles. And I think there was a question in the chat about appointed versus elected. And yes, this, this fellowship is for appointments, but like Shanti in, indicated earlier, we hope that it will inspire people to seek higher, higher levels of government, either appointed or elected in the future. But because we are running this out of our education fund, our focus is only appointments. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was be, we have an advantage here in Idaho because our state is so small. So when Siobhan's talking about strategic partnerships, one of the strategic partnerships that was already available to us is CVI and CVIF has a good relationship with the governor's office. So we already have, have that established. And so state appointments are not out of our league because we've already established, that was already established before the program started. Um, and then we also have fairly good relationships with some of the mayors in different cities and towns because we're working with and jointly with them on other projects with clean energy and um, environmental commitments. So we already have that established. So when we were looking at the infrastructure 
to build on the program, we, we started there to say, who is friendly to us and how can we get our folks appointed once they graduate? Do you have anything to add on this slide, Siobhan? Okay, next slide. Um, so with recruitment, so I was hired in August of last year. And prior to coming to CVI, I did work within the disability realm and community organizing. So I had an opportunity and I'm a, um, from Idaho. I grew up in a little town by the Stink River, 1700 people called Homedale. So I have, and um, my family's from here, the one side of my family's from here. So yeah, and I'm the one black woman on a school board in Idaho. <laughs> so um, it's very lonely, very lonely. So when I saw the job listing, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do this because I attend state conferences for Idaho School Boards Association and, and we're talking 800 people and I'm the only black person in the room. Um, and it's, it's just really lonely and also um, on, I was the only female on the board, on the school board for uh, some time and trying to get, you know, important things for me pushed through is difficult sometimes. So I applied and received and, and fortunately was chosen as the boards and commissions coordinator for CVI. And then I got right to work. Um, the Shanti had a really great outline already outlined for the curriculum but I needed to recruit people and recruit mentors. And so we got right to work using the strategic par partnerships that CVI already had and then drawing on my contacts. Um, who's in the picture in, that is on the slide is Landon Lebowski, who is a, a fellow that's graduated and Tia Nowicki, who is a fellow and Melissa Wintrow, who's a state legislator, she's a Senator. Um, they came to a luncheon and most of these pictures are pulled from our luncheon that we had. So I'm going to let Siobhan talk a little bit about the infrastructure online, what we had to build. Yeah, so when we um, first wanted to start recruitment for the 2021 um, fellowship program, we of course needed a um, good place to drive um, folks to that would have more information on the program. You know, it was a brand new program. So, you know, we didn't, we wanted to make sure that we had a lot of information, um, you know, kind of, you know, about what we wanted the program to entail, um, especially for fellows who are wondering, you know, what's the time commitment on this? <laughs> when, when do I apply? When will decisions be made? Um, and again, the time commitment is how, how often do we meet? Um, what am I gonna learn? All, all of that so that they would be um, interested in applying and they would also know what they'd be um, signing up for and committing for because it is, it, it's a big commitment. It's a, um, I believe six month <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm correct. So we wanted to make sure that that was all um, up front and center so that fellows again knew what they were, <laughs> what they were committed to and applying for. Uh, so our website, I'll link it in the chat um, so that everyone can kind of go there and check it out. Um, but again, we just had a little bit more about, you know, why we were doing this program, uh, what it entailed, and being um, up front and center about who um, we, you know, especially wanted to um, apply for the program. And um, in the beginning, when we were recruiting for just applications, we put together uh, flyers. Tony was doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. So we wanted to make sure she had a flyer to you know, give to folks to leave behind. Um, so we made sure to have printed flyers and then we uploaded that to the website as well um, so that folks could just download it to learn more about the program. And um, you know, we had a, like a sign up for updates. So if folks were just 
um, interested in boards and commissions news. Um, they were kind of tagged as such in our system so that we can send them, you know, curated updates around boards and commissions. For example, we'll be um, opening our applications for the 2022 program. So we'll be sending folks who signed up for um, that interest um, about the applications opening soon. And um, once we had our fellows confirmed, and once we also had, we have our mentors confirmed, and Tony did a great job of recruiting our boards and commissions mentors, and they were paired one-on-one -on -one with our boards and commissions fellows. Um, so we also wanted to show, you know, um, really bump up both of them. So there's sections on our website that has, you know, meet our 2021 fellows that has, you know, their bios and background and then same with the mentors so that folks again could kind of learn um, more about the people participating in this program. And I think that kind of, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then um, one last thing, we are doing a, fe a Friday fellow feature on our social media. So we're trying to also feature, you know, these great participants, you know, they dedicated so much time and, um, you know, just time and commitment to participate, participating in this program. And each and every one of them were just outstanding individuals who we wanted to celebrate. So we've been um, you know, kind of uh, talking to our members and showing who they are as individuals. So um, you can follow our Facebook and Instagram for mo more of those on Fridays. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. And Ron does an amazing job with highlighting all of our programs and um, in ways that are very, very professional. And um, I know a lot of our members comment about how good our social media and how much they know about CVI because of Siobhan. So thank you, Siobhan. Um, so, so the three groups that, that needed to be recruited are the fellows, which are really important, and then the mentors, and then the speakers. I was really intentional about wanting to have uniformity around the identities of each of these groups. So if we were gonna focus on um, BIPOC folks, LGBTQIA, people with disabilities for the fellows, I wanted to have the same identities for the, the mentors and the speakers. So really being intentional about um, the, we have the saying in, at, at CVI, you can't be what you can't see. So making sure and highlighting folks who are um, BSU professors who hold a LGBTQIA identity, things like that, so that folks can see themselves in their mentor and in the people who are actually training them. Um, so that was very intentional. With the uh, nuts and bolts of um, the program, we did have them sign an agreement and a contract. So the agreement was mostly the release of liability, things like that, that was done by our operations manager. And then the contract really said, I, as a fellow, am committing to come to every training um, to give it my all and to receive a stipend. So our, the stipend amount that we identified for this past class was $1,000. And we asked all the fellows to dedicate 20 hours a month to the fellowship. Eight of those hours were training and then the rest of them were meeting one-on-one -on -one with their mentor for an hour meeting one-on-one um, -on -one with another fellow, and then doing at least one piece of homework. Um, because we're in a pandemic, we did everything online until May. So the fellowship started in January, 2021, ran through June, but I'm sorry, April. We didn't see each other face-to-face -face until April based on um, how the vaccine rollout, rollout was going in Idaho, which was not well. <laughs> so people didn't actually get their first shots. Um, the people who didn't have any sort of uh, underlying health condition weren't even eligible to get shots in Idaho until about April, late March. So we were just being very cautious about that. Uh, let's see, next slide, slide nine. So um, in the recruitment, we had 21 people who were offered um, a spot in the fellowship and um, they, were, they all held identities that we were looking for. 
And we had six, seven people who identified as black or biracial, six who identified as LGBTQIA or non-binary and 12 people who identified as women. And for Idaho, especially that was fantastic, especially the black and biracial folks. There's just not that many black folks in Idaho um, outside of the immigrant and refugee community. So I was really excited that people were excited to serve. And everybody that I talked to was like, yeah, I've always wanted to know to serve, but I just don't know how. And this opportunity gave them um, what they needed in order to understand how government works. I mean, when you think about it, if you're my age, or even if you're even in your 20s, if you weren't didn't go into political science, you're not going to remember the one year of high school government you had in, in 12th grade. I mean, when I was a senior, I just wanted to graduate. I didn't care about government. So I only got interested in government after I I got a high school and I had a lot to remember and to learn about how government works. So most of the fellows are like, yeah, we really wanted want to do something, but we just don't know how. And it's intimidating when you're an adult to say, I don't, I don't understand this. And you live in the US and you should know this. Um, so we were our whole job, our whole goal for the curriculum was demystifying government and giving people just the basic information that you need to know about how decisions are made, why it's important to know, and um, just, just, the, just the real basic information, and then give them additional homework if they want. So I had two sets of homework. One was required, which was usually one homework assignment a month, and then a, I called it deeper dive homework that had um, videos and um, readings that people could actually do a deeper dive if they chose, but it wasn't required. So right now, um, during the fellowship, we had two people, including Salome, who applied for an open school board seat on Boise uh, School Board. Um, neither one was selected, but they did apply. We had two fellows who applied for state boards during the fellowship, and three fellows who appointed or were applied for and appointed to Boise City of Boise boards and one um, fellow appointed to a city of Boise, but he declined because he's finishing his master's and probably gonna move out of Idaho. So, but he was, he was actually offered the position. So that was a win. Uh, next slide. Tony, do you wanna also, so you said it's six months. Um, do you also just wanna say like how often you guys met? Um, oh, yeah. and you Sure. Yeah, so we met, like I said, because of coronavirus and we were starting in January, we d I decided to break up the online learning into two Saturdays a month for four hours. And that still sounds like a lot, but we did in the beginning of the day, we did um, self-care. So one of the other underlying things that I really wanted to highlight in the fellowship is the importance of self-care when you are in a governing body. I think in the US, we do a pretty poor job of encouraging people to listen to their bodies and to understand when um, enough is enough. And so the first 15 minutes, I had a, a, a Latina woman named Laura come and show the fellows different opportunities that they could have for self-care. So one day she did meditation. The next day she did, um, she would do like journaling. So for five minutes, we would just, we'd all be online, but we'd all be just journaling. Um, so that she, the fellows had opportunity two times a month to try some other self-care option that they had never maybe been exposed to. And I know at least three of the fellows said that that was one of the highlights for them because they'd never been in a space where people incur were encouraged to do self-care. And I think that's the only way you're able to fill your cup in order to continue to serve because public service is so stressful that self-care has to be part of your daily regimen in order to have the ability to do it for a while. And then um, every so, month they would also, they would meet with their mentor, they would have their homework, and then they would meet one another fellow. Yeah. Right? 
Okay. Yeah. So like I said, everything was online because of coronavirus. So they did Zoom meetings or phone calls with their mentor. And then I tried to pair them together so that they could get to know one another again, because we weren't face to face. So I, so they had to be intentional about developing their relations with, relationship with one another. I don't think there's any replacement for face-to-face -face relationship building. When I think about going to conferences, even for a few days, the, the keynotes and the breakout sessions are wonderful, but really I remember the people I meet and talk to and have deep conversation with. When that's not a, an option because of a pandemic, I had to figure out like what other ways can I create opportunity for them to get to know one another. And um, so that was the one-on-one -on -one, um, with each other during the month. And sometimes they'd have a homework assignment assigned uh, with their with their one-on-one, -on -one, and sometimes they didn't. Uh, okay, next slide. Yeah. So, like I said, the challenges was COVID and and um, not meeting together. Um, I decided to have a limited scope for recruitment because if we were able to eventually meet one on or face to face that I'd have a smaller area so people weren't coming from North Idaho and then going back and potentially infecting the whole community um, if we were if we were able to meet face to face. Um, engaging over Zoom, I think we're all like just you and now, like are y'all engaged? Or are you just playing Candy Crush on your phone? Uh, you, you never know. So trying to figure out how to be engaging on Zoom was definitely um, challenging. Um, finding mentors that had the same identity as the fellows. That was one thing I learned. If I paired mentors, uh, fellows with mentors who didn't have similar identities, then the relationship wasn't as deep as um, if they did have similar identities. So again, trying to find people in leadership positions or in just willing to um, be mentors who have similar identities is a challenge, especially in Idaho. And then I was running the program and in March of this year, I started the recruitment process because like we talked about before, it's all about relationship building and I don't want this to be transactional. So I was running the program two weeks out of the month and then recruiting two weeks out of the month. So I had to be very strategic with my time to make sure that I'm um, supporting the fellows in the program for all of the time, but also reaching out to others in other parts of the state to recruit for the 2022 program. Uh, next slide. Okay, and now I'm going to pass it to Salome to give us um, her perspective so that she can talk, Salome, if you want to talk a little about, about the pictures on the slide in your, um, when you start. Sure, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. This has been um, a really interesting time to survive and being able to be a member, to be a part of the um, fellowship was, I think, a bright spot in my life because I knew what I was looking forward to. I knew that I was going to meet with um, different people from this city with different perspectives, perspectives that I hadn't heard. And this lady here in green, next to the guy in green, uh, that's Meredith, that's the two of us. And this was the first time that we met face to face. Uh, she was my mentor. I still feel like she still is my mentor because it wasn't a relationship that was just siloed into this particular task that we were doing. I feel like we were able to connect uh, above and beyond the fellowship. And so I'm looking forward to being able to continue making connections with Meredith. I love the way that she challenged me to think outside my own little box. Uh, I was born and raised in Kenya. So obviously uh, by the time I got here, my identity was fully formed uh, only to find that, oh, you know, before moving to the United States, I had never really sat down to think of my blackness until I came here. And all of a sudden you have all these forms that you're feeling, whether it's at health and welfare or social security, or even at the doctor's office and they want to know what your race is. 
And I remember thinking, don't we just have one race, the human race, right? And then having to grapple with that and realizing that the race is a construct here and whether we admit it or not, it does uh, bear a lot of weight in the way things are done in the culture, in the relationships. And so it helped me do a deep dive into where I have come from and how am I going to show up? Um, we were laughing yesterday because I was saying, uh, I'll talk to people on the phone. And uh, when I show up, they're so shocked. Oh my goodness, you're a black woman. I thought you were British. And I'm thinking, well, they are British black women, right? <laughs> so again, kind of like swimming against those uh, stereotypes that people have, depending on how you speak or how you sound or how you present yourself. But then also realizing that those are actually strengths. So rather than shrinking back, uh, allowing that to help me step onto the platform, uh, allowing that to go over and above and realizing this is an opportunity for people to realize that not all people with uh, a little bit of melanin are African-Americans. They are actually Africans and I, our experience is very different. And then we come here and we're treated so very differently. And then helping people realize, I mean, it's okay that you have those assumptions, but can we work beyond that? Can we figure out what it is that we all bring to the table that will make this community better for doing that? So I absolutely appreciate the time that I spent with Meredith, uh, albeit over Zoom and the challenges of Zoom and, you know, wanting to reach out. I, I think that every time we meet in person now, it's almost like we're meeting in four dimensions, you know, post COVID. Um, but being able to do that and being able to realize, I think the highlight for me was um, the six degrees of separation. One of the speakers talked about the six degrees of separation. And I have to admit that having come from Kenya and having I feel I for the longest time I felt like a transplant that hasn't quite taken in this community because I think I'm from Kenya. I didn't really grow up here. When my daughter is talking about prom, I have no clue what she's talking about. And really just feeling like I didn't quite take. However, I realized that even though I may feel like I have not taken, I've actually taken more than I realize. I have grown up in this community. My daughter is growing up in this community. And so what can I do or how can I show up to help influence that? And while I may think that, oh, you know, I, I'd like to reach the governor, but I don't know how to reach him because there's no relationship between us. Really, there's just, we're just six steps away from being able to reach the people or the places that we would like to go through. And as I started examining even the relationships that I have close to me, it's almost like, oh yeah, I know, you know, Deborah's teacher, Deborah's my daughter, and the teacher knows somebody else. And then that person knows another person. And before you know it, what looked like an insurmountable problem is beginning to develop those legs into getting it sorted out, whether it's something personal or something professional or something in the realms of what we're talking about right now. Thanks, Salome. So um, the six degrees of separation was one of the things you learned. Can you think of anything else that you learned that's really sticking with you um, that one of the speakers had talked about? You know, I have to uh, chuckle when I think about uh, when we're talking about the environment and the fact that uh, people who have, you know, I'll call it more of a vanilla flavor, feel like, uh, you know, they can go camping, they can go hiking, they, they seem to enjoy their environment in ways that we didn't. So then examining what is it about people who have more melanin that prevents them from enjoying what this great state has to offer when it comes to the environment. And we talked about the fear that our parents raised us with, that if you're outside and if you're caught outside uh, and you're not where you're supposed to be, it's almost like you're supposed to be in school or at home or at work and that's it. And anything else in between opens you up and places you at risk uh, for you know being on the wrong side of the law. Uh, I remember thinking, uh, growing up in Kenya, we didn't walk because it was fun. We walked because that was the only way to get to where you were going to. So, you know, I wouldn't wake up one day and just decide, oh, you know, I'm going to saunter around my neighborhood for half an hour and call it exercise. It was an exercise. It was a means of getting to where we went to. When we rode bikes, it meant that you were going a longer distance. And therefore, in order for you to get there, you needed a bicycle. 
So it wasn't for the joy of feeling the, you know, the wind blowing through your hair as you rode your bike. It's because you, you, you were going further and you had this big pile of whatever that you were carrying to the other people. So sitting down and examining that and realizing, oh, wait a minute. So we do have this baggage with us that prevents us from enjoying the environment the same way that people would. And if I'm not going hiking, if I'm not going camping, if I'm not going and skiing in Bogus, then I really don't get uh, the, conserv the conservation efforts that are being made to, um, to make sure that those resources are available to everybody to make sure that those resources are not being abused. And so I just thought, what, what a big loss it is to our communities if we are not vested in that. And the reason we're not vested is really because of where we have come from and the, and, and the narratives that we have grown up with and the reality of the lives that we have lived. Um, even though I still tell my daughter, I don't understand why I would leave a perfectly good, warm, air-conditioned house to go and rough it out you know, uh, out, out there in, in the trees and the brooks and whatever it is. Um, I am now encouraging her to do that because I want her to grow up with some skin in the game since I didn't grow up with some skin in that particular arena. And uh, I'm excited to see her, you know, wanting to go out riding her bike with her friends or just for the joy of riding her bike or for the joy of going camping. In fact, she's, she, she's gone on a three-day uh, hiking trip with her school. And for me, I'm, I'm, I encourage even other parents who came here who may not have grown up with that kind of uh, a value, I encourage them to let their kids go and let them learn this and let them get to enjoy what our amazing state has to offer. And it's not just uh, Idaho as a state, it's also in other places. If you live along the Oregon coast, you know, what is it about the Oregon coast that you could learn and that you could develop a passion for? And letting our children do, do that so that when it comes to future generations, they've already learned about it from when they were young. Um, like, like I said, I mean, I definitely, I grew up in the country of, uh, from the country of Wangari Mathai, who was a Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner. And she's known for the Green Belt Movement. And again, the reason why she started the Green Belt movement wasn't because, oh, you know, she had nothing to do, but she noticed the deforestation that was happening in Kenya. And she noticed that women were the ones who were being most affected when they, their, their farmlands were not producing anymore. Kenya is a country that has, is at the mercy of the rain. So if the rain doesn't fall, that's it. You don't have food for your families. You don't have a source of livelihood. And so she started by uh, encouraging women to plant trees. And when they didn't have them, she would buy the seedlings and then she would go into the communities and help them. And I think that's what we're doing today. We are, there's this person, this, this organization that has noticed, you know what, if we don't take care of things now, there's a drought that is going to come that is going to render many of us, especially the most vulnerable, unable to function. However, if we can plant these seedlings, and I'm really excited that the, 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 this small organization, this small passion of Wangari Mathai uh, that started in Kenya is a worldwide movement today, all because one woman decided to notice the need and had a solution and was able to bring those two together in a way that benefited the community. So I believe that that's what we're doing right now, saying this is where the need is and this is what the solution is. And now let's bring the people together who are able to do this because this is not something uh, anybody can do on their own. I love, I'm going to conclude with this one saying, um, there's an African saying that says, and Tony has heard me say this many times, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, then we have to go together. And I believe that we all want to go further um, yeah. and we have to do that together. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question about, because you did apply for um, a commission, right? Um, are, and I'm just curious about how, how what that experience was like. Did that feel intimidating or foreign or was it fairly straightforward? What was the experience like? So initially, before my involvement in the fellowship, it was very intimidating. I didn't know what I was applying for. I didn't know the people that uh, would be sitting on these commissions. But after being equipped with the uh, information that we got from the different, different people in the different sectors, and then looking at the form is when later I asked myself, so what, is, what, what was I afraid about? 
I think it's a lack of uh, information and that that brings that fear because it's a fear of the unknown. But then once you start hearing what the different commissions do and what the um, requirements are, it actually is a pretty straightforward process. And um, Salome had, so Salome has uh, brought it to my attention. There's a lot of disparity with the immigrant refugee population with their children in school. And so that's where her passion is, is trying to help um, bring enlightenment to the biggest school district in Idaho and Boise about how important it is to, to consider the immigrant children when they're, with curriculum and how the cultures differ and whatnot. And so when we had the luncheon, um, she was paired with a Boise school uh, district board member, um, right? You, you talked to, to, okay, yeah. And so that she was able to give her perspective to the board member and vice versa. Um, so we tried to have, we tried to, I tried to pair people with um, decision makers where they can develop that relationship. And that was the thread throughout is from the beginning, the very first training was all about relationship and the importance of relationship. And then it was a touchstone every month where we're going to move things and we're gonna go far, like Salome said, if we focus on relationship and we prioritize that over transaction. And we're going to go deeper and it'll be more long term. Uh, we have a question. How do we apply these teachings in Texas? <laughs> I've only, I've been to Texas twice. So I would say that um, uh, you're your own best resource on what the environment, the political environment looks like for your state. Um, everyone has the information, you just need to access the information, I think. Um, so I would say the first thing you need to do is develop relationships, start by asking yourself who is excited about this. So on my Eastern Idaho tour, I talked to a bunch of people, but I could tell in some cities they were like, yeah, I think, I think either things are too convoluted right now. We, we don't really think there's anybody that can make a difference versus the cities who are like, we want to be involved. We just don't know how to do it. And where the excitement is, is where you should focus because that's where you're going to get the most amount of people who are interested in participating in the fellowship and the most support. So I don't think that there's a, a perfect recipe, like you're not, it's not a chocolate chip cookie that you're gonna be able to replicate in every state. It's gonna look differently in every state, but if you focus on where the excitement is and then start small and figure out how, who's excited and how you can um, give them the information that they need in order to become appointed and then go forward that's where that's where i started at least and um, i know salome talked a lot about the immigrant and refugee community in the treasure valley is hungry for figuring out how to make their voices heard because they've been here long enough now that they recognize that boots on the ground activism is not helping them advance where they need to go. And so giving information about, okay, this is how you serve on a board commission and then helping them to access it by introducing them to people, that's how they get their foot in the door. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, every, every city, every school district, every county has these boards and commissions. Um, and so it's a matter of identifying the one where you think you are best positioned to serve. Um, and so if you have a background in parks, then maybe it's the open space or parks board. I know, Tony, that you have several of your alums were just appointed to the open space board in Boise. Um, but maybe it's going to be the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. Maybe it's going to be 
you know, some other kind of sustainability commission for your school district. So it's really where you feel your interests and your and your expertise and your background uh, best position to serve and then figuring out, okay, well, what's the process? Do I have to get appointed by the mayor? Or is it my city council member? Or is it the governor? Like, who is it that actually makes those decisions and then building that relationship? So just the way that Tony talked about, um, you know, making sure that the commissioners are spending time together they're spending time with their mentors, but then they also invited people to come in and speak. It's all about building those relationships um, to help people um, get those appointments. So I don't know if you want to add anything else, Tony, about you know what's the best, what what was your experience about what was helpful in helping folks to get appointed? Well, that's an ongoing process, but um, again, we just looked at like what Salome says, six degrees of separation. Who do I know that knows somebody else that might be serving on a commission or might know um, something? So we couldn't get one of the local mayors here in my hometown of Nampa to answer. And so we've, I've, I knew, uh, the um, economic development director in the next town over in Caldwell. So, and he was a mentor. So I asked him, do you know anybody in Nampa who would meet with um, one of our fellows that lives here that wants to be on a board and commission? And sure enough, he did. So he connected her with the, the, the chief of staff for the city of Nampa. So we couldn't get to the mayor, but we got to the chief of staff. So um, it's, it's like, you know, trying to figure out where is where are our connections, how which area did we build the most um, relationship with, and how do we leverage that to s help people see that it's important that this young woman who now has tr been trained on what board what importance boards and commissions are can be a, a candidate for board and commissions. Let me just add something to that. I feel like um, one of the things that I tried to do was to remain invisible in this community where it's so easy to be visible because of your skin color, because of what you look like. But I found that by um, standing up to the need within the community, for example, during the uh, when the information was being given about the COVID vaccine or even about COVID itself, the virus, there was a lot of suspicion within the uh, refugee community. So trying to figure out, so why exactly is this suspicion, right? The uh, assumption was that it's because it's people of color, we've had a bad experience with, and I'm just thinking that's not our history. However, when we go back and we look at some of the cultural uh, lenses that we're using, when we look at some of the uh, language barriers that we have, because we're talking about a very technical uh, vaccine and a very technical explanation of what the virus is, and then what is the solution to that? Can we talk to people? So I found that by doing things like those within the community, you actually give yourself visibility to where, even though in the past people might have said, oh, I don't, ha I don't know who Salome is, and therefore, but people now are telling me, I heard you talk in this place and I heard you present about this and I really appreciate the way you address this. So giving yourself that visibility so that by the time you're applying in the, on the boards of commission, it's not a cold call, so to speak. It's almost like a warm transfer if you've ever worked in a call center where people are saying, so we know who you are, you've already uh, developed this credibility within the community and whoever the stakeholders are. Uh, recognize what you're doing and that it is in the best interest of the community. Thanks, Lome. There's a question about um, the fellowship. I know Shanti, uh, Shanti, you answered it, but the fellowship specifically for Idaho is on our website that it's in the, in the chat. Um, and then if you want to find out, there's another question about how do you find out what boards and commissions exist on the state website, on every state website, there should be a list of state boards and commissions in Idaho, there's 197. And so you could find that you can also do a public records request to find out that information for your state. And then each city on the city website, at least in Idaho, you can go to like city of Nampa, then they'll have a link to government. 
and then it'll have a link for boards and commissions. Most cities have not only the boards and commissions listed, but all the, also the names of the people on the various boards and commissions. It's really interesting information because you can, with some small towns, I went to a very small town called Driggs in uh, Teton County, which is right on this side of Wyoming. And they had, you know, I, I was like, okay, they have like five boards and commissions, but three people who are also on the city council are serving on boards and commissions, which makes it, makes the decision making even smaller. So um, I know I'm kind of nerding out on this, but this is kind of what I love to do. And so looking at that and then bringing this information, we did a presentation in another small town in Eastern Idaho where I did the same thing, said, well, there's 27 people serving on your five boards and commissions, but one person is the chair of two of them so that reduces it. And then two of the city council members are on boards and commissions. So I said, you know, there's really only 24 people in your community who are making your decisions for you. And they were like, but what, why is that? Like, that's ridiculous. So bringing information and kind of unveiling it because people don't recognize the power that boards and commissions have. If you're on the Parks and Rec Advisory Council, you have a budget that you, you get to advise the city council on how to use. Typically, the city council goes with whatever the board and commission is, is, has um, recommended. So depending on how big your city is, this could be in millions of dollars. There was another question about are we focused on only boards and commissions that are environmentally focused? The, that answer is no. We asked all of our fellows to adopt a pro-conservation attitude and every session we had a different um, presentation on a different aspect of co conservation. So what does clean water look like in Idaho? That was really interesting for everyone to note that farmers in Idaho are very adept at uh, water conservation and cleanliness versus our um, neighborhoods and neighborhood is not. So looking at what is water, because in Idaho we're a desert and so water is really important. Um, and then looking at how can you take what you've learned back to whatever board and commission you're on and use it. So for example, I'm on a school board and we use styrofoam plates. We have 9,000 students and we, we um, have them eat on styrofoam plates. So it's on my to-do list to, to talk with our administrators about why are we doing that? That's two meals a day for 9,000 kids. And we're filling our um, landfills with things that aren't biodegradable. So how can we change that? How much money would it cost? So just because you're on a border commission that's not necessarily um, a conservation style board doesn't mean you can, can't bring that information to your board and um, look at it differently and in more creative ways. Here's another question. What's the time commitment per, mo per month? Um, it depends on which board and commission you're on. So you should be able to find that on every, um, for every board or commission. So some boards and commissions meet every month, some meet every quarter. A lot of the state commissions only meet quarterly and all the time commitments are all over the place. For Nick Wyatt, who was in our, um, our slideshow, he was appointed to the Idaho Council on Developmental Disabilities. They meet two days per quarter. So you would have to take off work um, on a Thursday and a Friday one, one, one quarter, uh, so four quarters a year. So that's a significant time commitment. I was also on that council and I was working full time. And so I, I just made it work um, with, because it was that important to me. So I just made it work with my employer. Are there other questions? I, know I have a question, Tony. 
I know that you guys had some lessons learned about um, who ultimately ended up applying for um, a board or commission, and you guys are going to make some tweaks, my understanding, for to try and you know facilitate that process um, for the next the second class. And so I'm just curious if you wanted to share some of those lessons learned about um, what motivates people or helps supports people in applying and, and what kind of gets in folks way. Yeah, I think that's still something that we don't really have an answer to. We have two people, there was 16 people who were engaged by the end of the fellowship. So 21 started, we had 16 people very engaged. Um, of the 16, two people realized that they simply did not have the time. So what they learned over the six months was that they did not have the time to dedicate to apply for a board and commission right now. But they are very committed to applying in the future. One person is a single mom and she works full time and she's like, I can't juggle all of it. And the other one is considering a career change and didn't feel like she could make that commitment right now, but both are committed to applying in the future. So we're keeping them involved by asking them to be speakers and mentors instead of um, applying for a boarding commission right at the moment. We recruited from all ages. So we had our youngest fellow was 22 and our oldest turned 60 this year. So we had a very wide range of people. What I found with the young folks who are in their master's programs um, are that they're moving out of state. <laughs> they're saying, this is great, but um, I think I'm gonna move somewhere else. So they're taking this information elsewhere, which is great, but we really wanted it to stay in Idaho. That doesn't mean that I don't feel like recruiting people who are in their 20s is a bad idea. It's just something to consider when you are in, when you're in your recruitment. Um, and, oh, there was one other thing that I was going to say, and I forgot. Well, so, what about the older folks? What did you learn about the older folks? Um, yeah, the, oh, I know what I learned. So one of the unintended consequences of the fellowship is that it was very, for people who came into the fellowship with um, trepidation and maybe some low self-esteem, almost a hundred percent of those folks now are like knocking it on the out of the park as far as their self-esteem goes we had one quitter job she was like i've found through the fellowship that my job is wrong for me and i quit and she didn't even have a job <laughs> to go to and i was like whoa um and then a lot of people who said they had imposter syndrome and they felt kind of um apprehensive about the process now are really powerful in their in who they are and how they feel like they can serve in, in a variety of capacities. Um, and uh, what did you ask me, Shanti? I know that there were some folks that weren't prepared because they had been out of the workforce for a while or they didn't have a resume. And so you guys are right. modifying the curriculum, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So there was uh, a few people, mentors and fellows. We had one mentor was like, well, I'm going to apply for a board and commission now, but she said, I, I have been in the same role for 20 years. So I don't know how to do a resume and cover letter. And I had another person who owned her own business and she's owned her own business for the last 30 years. So she didn't have a resume and cover letter. So that was a gap in our learning. So that will we'll modify that and have a resume cover letter writing um, presentation during the fellowship uh, next year. Great. Well, I know people have been using the chat and the Q&A to ask questions. Um, we have a little time left, so please um, keep those questions coming. Um, Tony, you have a question about what kind seem to have the largest number of vacancies or vacancies that are hard to fill? The technical ones like planning and zoning, um, sometimes the historical, if a, a city has like a a historical society where they're trying to preserve different buildings. They want people with specific backgrounds like in architecture or history, um, a lot of the architecture pieces 
Um, or if you're applying for um, the tax commission, they want somebody who's familiar with taxes <laughs> and how taxing works and all of that. Um, that doesn't mean you can't learn. And you like school boards, I didn't know really much about school finance before I got on the school board, but you have to learn. So some of it you can learn and some of it they they would like a balance of people who are learning and people who already know. So um, it just depends. Um, but I know uh, Meredith Stead, the one featured here, she's the chair of planning and zoning for, zoning for Boise City and she has no background in it. She just had a passion for it and um, decided to take it on. And so she's done a lot of learning about um, everything that goes into planning and zoning so she can be a good chair and a, a good steward of um, public dollars. Yeah, I also wanted to share one thing that folks may not think about, but, um, you know, typically you have to be um, a citizen to run for certain offices in this country, but that's not usually true for boards and commissions. Um, and so this can be an important way for our undocumented or non-citizen, uh, you know, green card holders to serve in their communities. Um, and, and, you know, it's something you should definitely research because uh, we would not want to expose somebody to unnecessary risk. Um, but it is a way that um, people who are not citizens can still serve in their communities. Um, so this can be an important um, opportunity for leadership um, for folks to influence who could not run for office or vote or do other kinds of civic engagement activities. In the state of Idaho, the governor does require his own application. So each, um, each board or commission that's a state board or commission has their application that goes to the board. And then the governor has his own application. In his application, he does ask questions about citizenship and you do have to be, you, you authorize him to do a background check. Um, and in the state of Idaho, there's also an optional box to say what your party affiliation is as well. So yeah, so you have to, you probably should do some research about citizenship based on what your state requires. Now that's not the case for, for the cities. The cities typically like Shanti just um, pointed out, doesn't ask anything about citizenship. They just wanna know, can you show up and are you gonna do a good job? Do you have passion for it? So we have our contact information here um, and uh, please reach out. I know that somebody was asking, I want, I'm in Texas, and I wanna get started. So please reach out to me. Uh, I'm sure Tony can also have some thoughts on how to get started. Um, but yes, please stay in touch. We still have some time. So we'll pause for just a minute here and see if there's any other questions. And I don't know, Tony, there are a couple of our state affiliates on um, and Salome and um, Siobhan, there are a couple of our state affiliates on who are our North Carolina State League is gonna be starting their, their fellowship this year. And then there are other state leagues on who are interested. Do you have any words of advice um, for folks who are launching or anything you would have done differently? Um, or any words of advice for state affiliates that are gonna be starting um, their own fellowships soon? I think um, one, of the, one of the things that has served me well is because I have a background in community organizing that has helped me understand how to get people interested in the program, people who might not be interested, how to make it say, okay, um, why should you care about this? Why should you care about clean air? Why should you care about clean water? Sometimes it's just as little as people just don't know. They don't know. And so trying to deliver this, deliver the information in a way to help them understand why they should care. Um, so my background is not in, in conservation. So I'm, I've had a pretty steep learning curve to figure that all those pieces out. I, I can't say that I'm um, well-versed in any part of conservation of the environment, but I'm trying. But what I am very well-versed in is relationship building and the importance of being authentic and um, having a long lens and looking at while 
my this commitment that I made to CVI is three years. I'm going to live in Idaho for many years. And so having the long lens of systems change takes 10, 15, 20 years. So while we have a good group of 16 people who are going to be on boards and commissions, we need to reach a scale on each of the boards and commissions so that real change can happen. So holding both and so holding what we're doing now and then also looking at where do we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years and having that long lens and knowing that um, through C CVIEF, we're going to have to develop some really good relationships with our funders so we can sustain this program till we can reach the scale where real change exists. Salome, Siobhan, do you guys want to add anything? Uh, lessons learned or advice for other folks who are going to take this on? I think on the comm side, I, I have the comms background, um, but really communicating that why um, early on um, to your supporters, to the public, um, thinking about that why, thinking through it, you know, what are the representation percentages on, on your state boards and commissions and really communicating um, that lack of representation and the need for such a program uh, in your state to your members, to the public early on. So we did a lot of blog posts, just, you know, really just talking about the program and and why we were doing it. And we just kept repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. So that when we did finally um, push for recruitment for the 2021 fellows, um, folks, you know, had a good idea of the program and why we were doing it. Um, so it was pretty easy to communicate along the way as well. Salome. I think it really helped having uh, somebody like Tony, who was not afraid to step out of her box and build those relationships. I think part of the thing that really drew me in uh, was the interactions that we had on Zoom. Uh, we've met for lunch several times now and being able to feed off of that passion and see that dream so that it's not just a short-term thing, it's a longer term um, dream. I've been here for 17 years. I didn't think I'd be in Boise, Idaho for 17 years and yet here I am, right? And being able to catch that vision that even if I'm not doing it for myself, I'm doing it for the future generations to come. So having that long-term vision has really helped me uh, roll up my sleeves and say, this is something that I want to do. The other thing that I'd like to say is uh, I feel like through the fellowship um, and the interactions, there was this sense of belonging. And I think all of us are looking for that belonging because if I don't feel like I belong here, then it doesn't matter what happens. So Tony was able to do that along with the other people who I'm sure were working in the background to build that sense of belonging so that every fellow of the program felt like this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. And also, you know, like as we continued, there were some parts where you're like, whoa, I need to sit on a board or commission for three years. Do I have the three years? You know, given everything that's going on. So having those courageous relationships having those courageous uh, conversations and also the tenacity to not give up. Because I'm thinking if I was Tony and we started out with 21 and then we're down to 16, it feels like failure. But I'm thinking, man, focus on the 16 who are going to go out there and change the world that we live in. And um, don't allow, because I'm thinking for Tony, I, we haven't talked about this, but I'm just thinking there's got to be, there must have been things that were disappointing. There must have been things where you're like, man, I should have seen that, right? Um, but that didn't stop you and that didn't stop the program from going on. So just having that tenacity to not give up and to keep the end in sight. Thank you, Salama. Yeah, there's always disappointment. I mean, life is a balance of that, right? Disappointment and, and joy and celebration. Um, the thing that I think what I've been trying to embrace just over the last five years is um, how are we operating as a society 
And how is that working for us? And if, if we as CBI are only focused on transactional relationships, then we're not going to achieve the long-term change that we seek. And so really focusing on what does it look like to belong? What does it look like? What does welcome look and feel like? And how do we bring people along with us that we can create the change that we seek? Which means we have to go to our board and say, we're going to build deep relationships. And so data is not going to look as uh, shiny and spectacular for the next two years because we want to do deep work, which means we have to build relationships and figure out what is it that people care about and how to reach the people who care deeply about what we care about, about as CVIEF. Um, and then we'll figure out what is what does that welcoming feel like so that we can bring people along with us because people remember how you made them feel. They might not remember what you did for them or you know something transactional, but if you help them to feel welcome and you help them to feel belonging, then they're going to dedicate their time for you because time, frankly, is our most precious commodity. So we're, I'm asking people to spend all this time with me. So it's important for me to develop a relationship with them because they, and be authentically caring about them. Um, so that's, it's, this is like squishy and touchy feely, but um, this is what works because when we look back at how we've been doing business, it's not working and people are leaving and, you know, people aren't happy. So we need to figure out what is working and then do that. And then there was a question, Tony, um, about um, do most boards and commissions may have actual decision making power or are they mainly making recommendations to other decision makers? So I just shared yeah. in my experience mm -hmm. on the open school board, we rarely go against the recommendations that come to us from our citizen um, board. So I don't know what your experience is on your school board. Um, and then there are some boards and commissions that, um, that do have decision-making power here in Oakland. Our, um, our planning commission, they make the final decisions unless um, somebody appeals that decision to the city council. Their word is, that's it. Like, you know, 99% of the time, that's what happens. So I don't know if Tony, you wanted, or any of you wanted to add anything else on, on that one. Yeah, it depends. I hate to feel to sound like an attorney, but it depends. So every board and commission has different decision making power, but usually underneath there, there the board and commissioners are typically appointed by the mayor, um, the city council, or both, and. Um, every board and commission has, has just a, a different task. So if you're the human rights commission of Pocatello and somebody brings you a case that of discrimination, then um, not only will the commission look at it, but it'll be brought to the city council and, and the city attorney as well to make a decision about what's going on. Um, and then planning and zoning is different. What Boise, uh, Ada County, and where Boise is, they have a whole other um, Ada County Highway dis District. It's this whole other entity, and it's elected that um, impacts the city of Boise's roads. So it every because um, the U.S. there's no uh, requirement for cities to operate in certain ways, that's where the research has to go to like, how are cities operating and, and what is it, what does it look like and what decision-making powers do the individual boards and commissions have? We just saw a comment uh, from John say, it'd be great to see more environmentalists serving on boards and commissions. But I wonder if those opposed to environmentalism are also trying to fill vacancies on the same boards and commissions. I'm sure they are, which is why it makes it really important that LCV members and the members of our state affiliates are serving in these roles. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to relationships. I mean, if you can meet with other board members, because ultimately, usually the board members are, are who recommend or the the um, membership committee of each board is who recommends 
um, appointments to the city council, the mayor, the governor. So if you can get to know some folks and get on the same page on some other things, government is about give and take. In the school board, I might really want to hire another orchestra teacher, but my, another fellow board member might feel that we actually need another athletic director at a school. So I have to decide what, what is most important to me and how can I develop a relationship with this per person? And can we agree that, yeah, okay, I, I understand the athletic director is needed. So can, can you and I talk about um, aligning about an orchestra teacher in the future? So try, you have to, it's all strategic alliances. Um, while keeping your morals and values intact. <laughs> so there's not like an easy way to do it. But what I found is that um, being a black woman in Idaho, I'm immediately disliked by a whole host of people here, especially since 2016, it's gotten uh, more difficult. And so I take the challenge on like this, what can I align myself with, with this person? I don't care if the person's a white supremacist. I'm gonna ask in, uh, curious questions until I can find something. Um, the chair of the school board and I don't, don't really get along very well, but he is from a rural farming background. My stepdad was a cattle farmer. So that's where we can align. And that's where we can have some respect because he, he knows that I know what it's like to have the hardship of being a rancher. And we have that in common. So having that as our touchstone and bringing it up and reminding him that we are the same, we grew up the same, helps us have a amicable relationship in the public space. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have fairly heated arguments. Um, but it's just how we can operate in a civil and respectful manner. All right. Well, I really want to thank you all, Siobhan, Tony, Salome, for sharing your experiences and your wisdom with us. Um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat, so I'll pause and say speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, and if we don't see more questions there, then I will thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and we will, we did record, and so we will um, share this um, on our website. So thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Carrie, for coming. <laughs> Bye.